Okay, so we're doing resolving power. We shine blue light at this barrier. We get at some angle. There's gonna be a central maximum here, as Zane said before, but at another angle, or as Bell said, when the path difference is theta, we get another max because our phase shift has uh, gone one full wavelength and crest to be crest and cross to cross. We get a maximum. Now, what if we are not sending through just one wavelength of light? What if we're sending red light one. as well? I'm using a pink marker, but. Is the lambda for red light bigger or smaller? A small, small, a, uh, a smaller than blue one. Smaller than blue one. Blue is smaller than red one. Uh, red is closer to infrared, so that means that would be a bar. Which one is higher energy? Red. Blue. 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 What kind of sunlight burns your skin? Uh, yeah. Ultra Ultraviolet on the blue oh. end. Blue. Blue end. Um, so blue light is higher energy, higher <laughs> frequency, smaller wavelength. The smaller wavelength is more energy. It makes sense if you think about it, right? Yeah. If you have something just <laughs> machine gun, it's high energy, small wavelength. Yeah. So red light is a longer wavelength, somewhere yeah. around 700 nanometers as opposed to 400 nanometers. Okay, so take 20 seconds, turn to the person beside you and decide, is this first maximum for the red? Is it gonna be above the blue or below the blue? Oh. Yeah. Technically. Well, ignore the central maximum, the, the next one. Well, I think it's an equation. Sine theta equals to uh, d over y. Uh, the lambda is d sine theta. The angle's going to be smaller. No, no, this so equation is sine theta equals to d over y. It's going to be lower. It's going to be lower. It has to. The, the red maximum is going to be lower than the other one. The, the theta will be greater. The, 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 distance the distance between the slits is not changing, right? Oh, so this is D. Yeah, this so is if lambda is raising, my theta has to go up as well. And that makes conceptual sense if you think about it. If my path difference has to be lambda, and my lambda is bigger, I need a bigger path difference. So my angle will be bigger. Does that make sense? Yeah, wait, the, the red is a larger red. Larger wavelength. Oh, oh, I thought I was seeing a small one. Okay. So let's draw in these lines for the red. And you'll kind of see that because this is a little bigger, I didn't draw this to scale, but. Because lambda is bigger, you're going to have a bigger theta. Okay, so in a diffraction grating, you are going to end up, if you, if you put white light through a diffraction grating, you end up seeing the different wavelengths of light. Yeah. Okay. So just... Get your hands on one of these. Just pass those around. Those are spectroscopes. Can you, can you check me one of those? This is a spectroscope, and so it's got uh, an eye hole on the skinny side of the triangle. And you're gonna look through that. On the end, you have this large gap. That's where you're gonna see the wavelength. So don't point this at the light, but there's a very small slit at the top. And you want to point that little slit at some light source. So we can do that at the fluorescent. And if you get the fluorescent in the slit and you look down at the bottom, you will see the spectrum of the fluorescent light. Oh my God. And you can see this uh, from the sun or from fluorescent light. And that's a continuous spectrum that you're going to see. Why is it all the colors? Oh my God. Yeah, this white light is made up of a mixture of all the different wavelengths of light. And the diffraction grating, which is here, and I have one of these 
that is apart right now. So you can see there's just a little film, it's just a little diffraction grading, it's a bunch of lines. And what I'm gonna do right now, put these on TV. Sorry, Anthony's. And then I'm just gonna put this here and see if we can see it. Wow, you can see the camera diffractions, right? Now, there's a bunch of different ones, right? Yeah. And if I move this down, see if I can get the whole picture here. Did this before. You're trying to get the whole light? I'm trying to show you the different orders, but it's not so easy. Oh, there. Look at the, the Can you lights only show the higher level It's only the Can you see oh, oh. Can you see in the foreground there's some big bright lines, but then in the background there's some as well? Yeah. Yeah. And then behind the background there are others as well. And then behind that background there's others as well. Do you see that? Yeah. They go way up there. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. What's a big oh, chunk of light? There's like different fields of spectra, right? Yeah. Those are the different orders. So with a diffraction grading, instead of having just two slits, you have a whole bunch, right? And so you have the lines from these two slits are interfering, but also this is interfering with the third one. Different theta, and with the fourth one. And, and so you have all these different Ds, right? All these different distances between the slots. And so you get these, all these different, uh, we call it an order. So it's all these different orders of interaction. Okay. If you are wondering, okay, Mr. Espinan, great, what do I need to know? This is what you need to know. R is resolving power, and that is equal to the average wavelength that's incoming over the smallest difference in wavelength that is perceivable. Does that make sense? So if you look up here at our drawing, you have blue light and you have red light, right? How do you find the average between blue and red? Exactly. And the difference between these two wavelengths is the difference here. Now, there's a point where, like if you have, th these are just two separate colors, but when you look at your continuous spectrum, you get all these different wavelengths, right? So you're seeing all these different maxima. There is a point where these two are so close together that we cannot resolve them. Just like when you poke your skin, if it's close together, that looks like one thing. So if these lambda are really close, you're gonna have your two maxima are gonna be super close and it's just gonna be one maximum. one maximum. So this delta lambda is the smallest difference that we can distinguish between. Does that make sense? That is also equal to <coughs> m, which is the order. So this is, if you're looking at this, the, this slits beside each other, that's second order, or the third, or the fourth order, times the number of actual slits in the grading. So this we call order. Normally, if IB throws one of these on an exam, they just tell you which order you're working in, but they will make you work out the number of, we call them rulings, Or, or just lines in the diffraction grading. Oops, sorry. This formula is in your data booklet, so you don't have to necessarily remember it, but you should understand how it works. Looking at this first part of the formula, what are the units of resolving power? Watts? No. no. Lambda. 
nanometers or say that again, Zane? Nanometers. Over. Over. Nanometers. Nanometers. Nanometers over nanometers. So what's the unit? <laughs> Not a ratio. Nothing. 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 Exactly. No unit. No it's unit. just a ratio. It's just a proportion. So there are no units for resolving power. It's just a function of how, what percentage of that total average wavelength coming in are we able to distinguish between. So if your resolving power was 0.1 and you had 100 nanometers coming in, yeah. you could resolve to within one nanometer. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you had 100 coming in and your power is 0.1, you can resolve 1% of your cell from it. Okay. Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is it good units nanometer that the meter and uh, It depends on the problem. If your problem makes you convert the nanometers into meters, then then you gotta stick with that. But if you if you're just given both in nanometers, then it's fine, you don't have to convert because the ratio will be the same. All right, that's number one of two little things that I have to do with you today. That's resolving power. And last is the Rayleigh criteria. Yeah. I have here a lens. Okay. It's a convex lens, which means it's kind of rounded outwards, right? Um, this lens will make an image. You have two of these in your body. Where are they? Eyes. In your eyes, yeah. I'll see if I can catch this on the video. I don't know if I'll get to it. We have light coming in through the window, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, do you guys want to come with this? Yeah, come on. What's going to happen to the rays as they go through this lens? Bill, maybe just give it a phone. Come on over here, Bill. Come on, you can stand here. Yeah, they're going to hit and refract and curve in, right? Where those beams come together is called the focal length. Thank you. Focal length of this lens. So right here, it's unclear. But if I move this closer to the paper, you can see it. So that is a real image. Can you see it on the back, too? Yeah. yeah. What do you notice about that image? Look at it from here. Oh, it's like a reflection of the. It's upside down, right? Is it a reflection of the window? Yeah. Oh, it is a reflection. Is it right way left and right, or is it backwards? It's like backwards. It looks backwards. It looks backwards. Can you see where the hat? Can you see the hat? Is it upside down? It's flipped. It's it's flipped. It's flipped, right? So it's upside down and flipped. It's flipped across every axis and right? That's how your eyes work. And that is how your eyes work. Yes. So I'll let you guys. Uh, I'll leave these here. You can play with it later if you like. Okay. So like. So if you have a lens, no, it's just how they're Let's see the brain Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Bill. It's going to be hard. I admit it. Yep. Oh, there's a dysfunction in the optical level. Am I on the screen again? No. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's draw ourselves a little lens here. Uh, a little piece of trivia, I, I forgot to tell this in my other class. That lens has a specific focal length, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's going to change depending on where you want to focus on. How does your eye 
focus on things closer or farther away. Yeah, so you have muscles. Your lens is soft, right? So when your muscles pull, it squishes the lens down. When it relaxes, it pops up. But mine doesn't pop out fully anymore, which is why I need cheaters. Oh, is that why when you can't see, you squint your eyes so you can see clearer? Yeah, because yeah, when you squeeze, it kind of pushes your, it squishes your uh, lens a little bit. Well, I don't know, it also lets in less light, too. Wait, so how does the contact work? Does contact? It, does it like make your eyes like Good question. It's like a lens over your eyes. Exactly. So your contact lens, if your, if your eye, if your eye's lens is too a flat, yeah. then your focal length is going to be farther back, right? Yeah, yeah. So the focal length is past your retina, so you don't see things clearly. Yeah. So what a contact lens does is it provides another lens so that the rays coming in will refract a bit before they get to your lens. So instead of having straight rays in that go out here, you have uh, rays that are already angled, and so your focal length will get shortened up to where it hits your retina. Uh. Let's say we have two stars. One out here. These don't have to be different colors, but I'm going to draw my different colors. And let's say we've got a lens uh, kind of like in your eye, or maybe this is in a telescope or something. And you have these rays of light right here. Let's leave the magnification part out of it. And let's just say that the theta between those two stars is the angle that we see them at. And you're going to have some kind of screen down here. Maybe it's your retina or maybe it's something else. And you're going to have this image hit here and the other image hit here. And those two thetas are going to be the same. It might be a little bit different depending on the situation. Okay. There's a point at which, if you take the, let's say these, these are two, uh, bless you. Let's say these are two stars and they're far off in space. If I move them farther away, what's going to happen to the apparent distance between them? It's going to get farther apart. If you back up away from two oh, people, they look closer and closer and closer together, right? Oh, actually, yeah. Yeah. Is there a point where those two stars will appear as one? Yes, of course. At a certain distance, they will. Right. Our job is to define where that point is and how that works. So, uh, a guy named Lord Rayleigh made a convention, and he said that, let's just say that this, oops, wrong, let's say that this is your diffraction pattern from the yellow star. We'll say these are both uh, just visible light stars. This is not about wavelength anymore, just. And he said there's a place when they start to come close together, they will diffract through the lens as they would in a diffraction grating. And there's gonna be a point where they start to come together. And it's it gets it gets a little gray. There's a little gray area there of okay, when they're when they're two maxima are like super close together, it looks like one thing. And then when they're far apart, it's definitely two things. So where is that point? And Rayleigh said, well, why don't we take two defined places and make make that our barrier. So if you take the first minimum of the one wave and you draw the maximum of the next wave over top of that, what does that sort? Zane? That's where top means, like crest, right? Exactly. This is going to be the place where these two waves are just barely resolved. So what's gonna happen if I move them closer together? It becomes one. Yeah. Then we cannot distinguish anymore. If I move them farther apart, 
Zero. Then there are two separate things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, let's write this down. See if we can explain this properly. So when one waves central maximum, we'll call it, is directly in line with another waves first minimum we would say that the two waves are just barely resolved This is not something that is like a, necessarily a property of the universe. We just needed a place where to kind of draw the line. And Rayleigh said, you know, it's pretty close. When that when those when that maximum is over the minimum of the other, it's like just barely there. And so any closer we say it's one, any farther apart, it's two. There is a formula for this, actually. We can do this mathematically. And here's where you have to trust me a little bit. The theta here, when just barely resolved, is equal to 1.22. And the 1.22 is solvable, but it's complicated. We'll talk more about this later, because there are some kind of surprising connections with resolution and the rest of physics. It's not just a waves thing. And we're going to put that over D. This D is, it's not the, um, it's not the distance between the slits because this is a lens. This is the diameter of the lens. Uh, and this is another thing that I forgot to talk about with my other class. Hopefully some of them are going to watch this video if I can make it work. Uh, what happens to theta if your lens gets bigger? Theta gets smaller. So what does that mean if theta is smaller? The two stars are closer together when? What, what situation does this all describe? When the better result. Right. Um, so this is all when barely resolved. Okay, so if are we gonna be able to let's say we have two stars and we're looking at them and they're just barely resolved. If I look at them again with a bigger lens. Am I going to be able to see them as two separate things, or are they going to go together as one? Let's say I look at two stars, and they're just barely resolved. I'm looking through a telescope. And then I go out and I spend John's money, and I get a bigger lens. And I look again. Are those stars going to combine as one, or am I going to see them separate? Your intuition is correct, Panice. They're going to separate. You're going to see them higher resolution. How does that work with the math here? This got yeah, bigger. I told you. How? This got bigger, and theta gets smaller. Smaller, which means you can see barely resolved things at a smaller angle. Okay, so your your precision of resolution just got better. Does that make sense? So let's say you're using a small lens and your theta is big. 
These two things are just barely resolved, right? I increase the size of my lens, my theta is smaller, and here they would be barely resolved, but they're still out there, the stars have not moved. So now I'm seeing them separate. Ooh, yeah. nice, clear detail. Does that make sense? Oh, but it only changes one day when you turn that way. Oh yeah, if you move them farther and closer, then everything changes again. So that's just, it starts on moving. So if you have a bigger, so if you want to see things really far away. You get a bigger, bigger lens. You need a bigger lens. So now we're, now we're James, James Webb, right? I did, yeah. Wasn't that cool? Beautiful. Beautiful. Sorry? Doesn't it depend on the... Correction of the lens? Like, doesn't the lens... Can the smaller lens can be, like, more optimized? So it's like, as simple, like, the... Yeah, so this is... I'm giving you a very simplified version. Um, most telescopes have two lenses. Right? So you're... You're... Um, kind of leveraging the properties of the lens, right? You can have more than two times. Um, but in general, a bigger lens is going to give you a better resolution. And of course, why is James Webb a telescope? Why is it in space? Why do we need it to be in space? James Webb is looking at things very far away and very much in the past. What? Yeah, because it's looking at the past. Yeah, I think because so, the atmosphere. This is a right? really stupid question. No, go ahead. So, can this telescope put a camera on it? Could it take a picture of like my dead yes. like yes. dog from like five years ago? No. Theoretically, yes. It's too far. It's too far. Yeah. Like it's too far away. Like in real life, present day, no. But theoretically, yes. So if you could figure out a way to travel faster than the speed of light, like if I could put you five light years away, like that, somehow we figure out how to bend space time and we just go, Penis, go, so out here now. You could turn around and look back, which we can't, but if you could, you could turn around and look back at the earth and you would see the earth five years ago. And that's what the telescope is doing right now? Yeah, so when you look up in the night sky, do you see stars as they are right now? No, you yeah. see them whatever light years are. Yeah. It's the same. It's the sun, it's the sun exposure. Oh, hopefully I see it exposed like seven minutes later. That's right. Yeah. So whenever you look in the night sky, you're looking into the past. Um, the trouble with looking into the deep past is that that light's been going for a long time. What shape is a star? It's a sphere. So it radiates photons outwards, right? What happens over time as those photons go further away? They spread out. They spread out. They're further and further apart. So something farther away, i.e. farther back in the past, there's just fewer photons coming our way. So there's a story, and I, I didn't tell this to my other class um, either, so hopefully you're watching this. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope oh. happened when I was younger. <laughs> and uh, we got it out there in space and we turned it on and it didn't work. It was broken. So then the space shuttle went up and fixed it. Yay! And then we get all the pictures from Hubble in this place in Chicago. And these pictures started pouring in and it was like, oh my gosh, there's no light pollution. We can see all this stuff in space. And everybody was fighting over the time for that telescope. So all the people in astronomy, physicists all over the world, they're like, oh, can we have 10 minutes to look at this thing? And they're like, oh, fine. And, you know, and every, it was all scheduled out. And the director of the Hubble Space Telescope, he got three days cumulatively that he could do whatever he wanted with the telescope. And people said, oh, you should look at this, you should look at that. Jennifer. And some of his younger grad students said, point it at the dark and leave it pointed there for the whole three days. And people around him were like, don't do that, that's so dumb. You're just gonna end up with blackness. But he listened to them. And so for three days, the Hubble Space Telescope was painted at, it was pointed at this dark place in the sky. And so it, it would be like, you know how when you're at night, when you click your phone camera and it goes, 
and it leaves the shutter open for longer because it's dark, so you need time for more photons of light to come, right? Yeah. So if you're looking at the dark, you need to open that shutter for a long time. He left it open for three days straight. Yeah. And when they got the picture, oh. it wasn't dark. It had thousands of galaxies in it. Oh. I love that. And those galaxies were from millions and billions and billions of years ago. And they were there. They're there. You can't see them with the naked eye. You can't see them with a regular light telescope if you just open the shutter for a bit because there's so few photons coming from them, right? But he left it open for longer. And so now we've got the James Webb out there and we're looking deep, deep past, like in the first third of the life of the cosmos. <laughs> but we have to, it's really hard because you can't allow any light pollution. Any light pollution is going to spoil it, right? So it has to be in a place, it's called a, it's called a Lagrangian orbit, where it's uh, constantly in the Earth's shadow of the sun. There's no light going no light there and it also has to be really really cold so they had to le let it sit there for three months before it would work it has to be within a degree of absolute zero i think why really really cold because what is heat energy, energy. energy. photons photons any heat hits that telescope poof image gone so it has to be super cold so it's been sitting out there for quite a while now and we're just getting the first images back and what we were expecting was to see primordial universal juice, <laughs> right? Like no galaxies, nothing. Galaxies hasn't formed yet, we thought. But there are. But a, a, the first picture is like, I, like, I don't want to like say things that I don't know, but the first pictures look like there's galaxies in it. And that's, okay. that's, gonna, be, that's gonna be trouble for astronomy and for physics. Like wow. apparently, our vision of how the cosmos formed, uh, there, there's, there's a trouble with it. Well, because it, it should have been an explosion, so this should be the result, like the result of the We're not looking that far back yet, but our timeline of what happened is off somehow, I think. It, it appears that way. Yeah. It appears that way. We've got to take more pictures and do so more, you know. So that the, the Big Bang Theory could it, it may need it may need adjustments. adjustments yeah. It may need adjustments. Yeah. Which is pretty exciting actually. That is exciting. Yeah, it's it's really neat. Um, sometimes you think you got it all figured out and then you go out and experimentally test it and it's you didn't have it all figured out, you know. Which is kinda what astronomers were hoping for. Right? We're hoping for experimental evidence that will push us in one direction or the other. Um, let's do a problem. <coughs> So that you know, and I gave this problem to my other class, and I kind of muffed it up. So I'm going to do a better job of it now. Um, let's say, who here drives? Panise drives a car. So Panise is in her car. Okay. Can you can you see me over here on the video? Uh, no. no. Can you, uh, David? Could you uh, just twist it for me? Panise, what kind of car do you drive? I drive a rent, um, really really old. Oh, it's Chevrolet. My Chevrolet. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sheesh, <laughs> Dawn. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he is, is driving her. Her uh, red Chevrolet. And she's got her beams of headlights. And we're all watching it. We all have normal eyes, so we have a lens in our eyes. And oh, is this? sorry. You're looking your eye, and here's your pupil, right? This is your iris. I know, it's like the giant eye, I don't know. How wide is your pupil? No idea. One centimeter? I have no clue. One centimeter. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One yeah. million. Oh, how dark you, you guys need some to work on your measurements. Well, like, how, how am I supposed to know? Well, let's measure. Let's measure. You're going to measure my. Oh, it's a centimeter. I'm going to say five millimeters. Diameter? Five. 
Let's say this is five millimeters. What letter is that in our formula? D. D. So D is five millimeters. What wavelength of light comes out of a car's headlights? Average. Six hundred. 600? Um, 600. Well, it's, like 600. Yellow, it's 4 to 700, right? It's like yellow, yeah. So it's like 600. 600. 600. 600. 600. You think, well, that would be towards red, would be closer to the 700. Should we say 600? 600. Yeah. Okay, let's say 600 nanometers. Okay, what else do we need? That's it. That's it. So the question is if Penise throws it in reverse and she back, wow. and we're all standing here really watching. This is like us. You have good vision. Uh, if we're watching, how far away does the car get until the headlights appear as one? Uh, so so eventually, you're going to have this lambda from this is one headlight and the other headlight, right? Uh, this angle is going to be small, right? So we, we were doing like sine and tan and stuff for this, but it's a small angle. So basically, you say if this is the length to the R. Oh, we, have, we need this too. How far apart are the headlights? On a car? Oh, wow. One meter. Like one meter? One meter? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. A meter yeah. for yeah. 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 We'll say one. That's what my other class said, too. We'll say one meter. Um, this is going to be, that theta is going to basically be, um, one is going to equal L lambda. Because right? sign, the sign of a small angle is zero. Wait, so it's not Yeah, some of my some class kids did it that way too, Bell. They, they said this is 0.5 and went da 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 da. We could do that too. Oh, you want to do it that way? Okay, let's say it's. 0.5, and, and then we're going to do sine, right? Uh, so we'll say this is theta over 2. So sine of theta over 2 is going to equal opposite over hypotenuse, so 0.5 over L. L. And so L equals uh, 0.5 over sine of theta over 2. It's going to be hard. Oh, wait. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. And, and so we just have to work out theta, right? And we know theta because that's 1.22 lambda over d. Okay, so work out theta first, put it in here, and tell me the L. Go. I'll do it too. Oh, and, and this is where this is where I stumbled with my other class. I couldn't remember if this theta was in radians or degrees. This theta is in radians. Okay. <coughs> it's in radians? Yeah. What? The 1.22 is based on the idea that that theta is so going to be in. So we have to convert it from radians, right? Put your calculator mode in radians. No, just put, yeah, just put your calculator in radians. Just push mode. I don't want it. Divided by 1.25. I don't want it. The question is, how deep are you? Yeah. Okay. I don't know why if Texas Instruments wouldn't put like a radian degree button. My favorite aspect of my calculator is the fact that I can see games on it. I pulled the double images on it. Very useful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, five times ten to the negative three meters. That's how I would do it. As long as they're the same, you could put this in nanometers if you wanted to. Okay, so what's theta? 1.46 times 10 to the negative 4. 1.46? Yes. 4.64. Four. Times 10 to the? Negative 4. Negative 4. Radian. Radian. 1.46? Everybody agree? Yeah. Okay, so we got this. If you take that and divide it by 2, and then take the sine, inverse it, and times 0.5, what are you getting? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, Sixty-two point three kilometers. What? How do you? Does that sound right? Sure. In my other class, they said it was three millimeters, and it was quite a bit less than that. It was like five kilometers. Wait, the the sixteen point six point eight kilometers. Sixty-eight. Oh, that's not divide two. Oh, that should be. Uh, oh, yeah, because be this is. Yeah, I have to divide by two. Okay. I got six. Then it's uh, 100. 6,800. 125? How is it when you divide the number it got bigger? I don't understand. <laughs> you divide this in half. Which is. 7.31 to the negative 5. Yeah, but it's smaller, right? It's not bigger. It's negative five. Do I have to do this? Uh, it's, 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 it is sixty-eight. It is still sixty-eight. Sixty-eight. So we've gone from sixty-two to sixty-eight. Okay. Not really. So my other class, they said a pupil was three millimeters. So we got a we used a bigger lens which makes sense, we can see things resolved at a longer distance. Right. So if you grow your lens, better resolution. Yes? It's the subject of light, but not this. Okay. So if I look, so sometimes when I look at, at the video... Should I leave the video play or should I... Okay. Um, the lights kind of flicker at like a quick speed, but it's not like the light that's designed to be flickering from the... What is this? What, where is this light? If you look, if, if I look at the lights across the beach. Across the beach, okay, yeah. yeah. From, from different households, they'll be like flickering, despite, you know, they're at 60 hertz probably. Why would it be flickering over the distance? Uh, are you looking, is this a reflection in the water? No. Just a light that's really, really far away. It's a good question. We need a video. Maybe the people. Maybe the people. Well, I know. Maybe the people are turning the lights on and off. Yes, periodically. You never know. It is interesting on how much we trust the images coming into our eyes, but they do play tricks on us sometimes, right? Yeah. I mean, things refract, and. You have reflection and you have all these kind of different things. So our eyes are good, but they do do strange things sometimes. It's interesting to think, yeah, the light is flickering at 60 hertz. Would that slow down if you were looking at it in the water? Is it during the day or at night? At night. At night. I wonder if there would be, because if you had, it's just a, Yes. If you have the light coming straight at you, you're seeing that light. But you have another beam that's coming down, hitting the water and reflecting into your eye as well. And there would be interference between there. So you get 60 hertz, but this one's taking a little bit longer to come, right? So maybe you have the difference in hertz. You're getting constructive, destructive, constructive, yeah. destructive. That would be interesting to work out if that was possible, I don't know. Yes. So does that mean that the car could be 68 kilometers away and you could still differentiate between these two headlights? Yeah. If you are, if our wavelength is 600 and we have five millimeter lens, and if we did our math right, 
than 68 kilometers away. That does sound like a long way to me. Yeah, no. I will tell you, I'll, 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 uh, I'll fess up that this is a problem in the book. It is on, it's number 53 in the, in chapter 24, is it chapter 24 or 25? Which page? No, it's not this one. Hold on. Yeah, it is on page 790, and it's number 53, and the answer in, to that problem... So we have different numbers, so it's the same. Yeah, it'll be, it's a little bit different numbers. They say, they say that the headlights are two meters apart, and they say the pupil is five millimeters and the wavelength is 500 nanometers. It's a really wide car. <laughs> yeah, that's a really wide car. Yeah, that's a long I way. Well, I know. Like, that seems like it's too far. But I'm How guessing this truck? is like perfect conditions, really, really flat. Okay, so check our math over again. Did we do it right? Wait, what are you talking about? Like really flat, like, no other like I'm going to do the math again. I got it. I got it. I got it. You did it again? And then you divide that by. So you you use mine. That's okay. Is the over two part of the side theta or is it? Uh, you're dividing over two. No, it's, yeah. You read it all in there. 1.46 times 784, that works. That's in radians. Yeah. That's in radians. So if we divide that by two. Yeah, it's six point. It's 6,830 yeah. meters. Uh, yeah, six. Not sixty-eight thousand meters. That's what I think. I'm not saying sixty-eight. Just the kilometers. Well, not even sixty-two kilometers. I think we're going to move the decimal. Is it six point eight kilometers? I feel like I could see that it's kilometers away. I don't feel like that's how. No, no, you cannot. And it's way too far. I feel like I could. I feel like I could. So 6.8 kilometers, which Dana was right to question the 68 kilometers, but 7 kilometers, that makes kind of intuitive sense. So I think we should never measure things in kilometers. So you should have said meters. Kilometers is a French thing. Uh, you don't see it. You solve it. Oh, we solve it. And I will also give you some of the problems. 